talk. Um, so this is mainly a Java conference, and it looks like we're going to have a purely Java presentation now on some of the yep. unusual or interesting aspects of Java 8. OK. Uh, can everyone hear me? Is the mic working? Can you hear me? No. It's not. Oh, there we go. It's working now. Better? OK. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm going to talk about Java. If any of you were here in the last talk, I'm going to talk about similar stuff to uh, what uh, he was showing off in uh, Kotlin in Java, hopefully. So I'm uh, Benji. I'm Benji Weber on Twitter. Uh, I'm a Java developer. been writing Java for getting on for 15 years now. Um, and I work in London for an ad tech company called Unruly, uh, mostly working on our ad exchange, which is kind of uh, real-time auctions for deciding who gets to show you ads when you load web pages online, uh, which so, has to be quite fast, and uh, we do pretty much everything in Java. Another thing about me is that I really like Java, which uh, I often feel like I should apologize for. Um, Java, um, the JVM is really popular, everyone seems to love it. Java the language is really popular in terms of the number of people using it, uh, but I don't often talk to people and they're really enthusiastic about Java the language itself. They often have lots of gripes about it. Um, but yeah, I, I really like Java the language and hopefully that will come across today. What I'd uh, like you to take away is uh, going from, I wish Java had this feature, um, then I could write the code that I want to write and the style that I want to write. I could express my domain problem so much more clearly. Shift away from that to how can I write the code that I want to write, write in the style that I want to write it in Java itself, um, thinking about what tools we actually have to do that. Uh, it's quite a code-heavy talk. Um, don't worry if you don't fully understand everything. The uh, code samples are all online. I'll give you the link at the end. Um, it's also quite unusual code. I've deliberately chosen these examples to be unusual. I'm not suggesting you go off and uh, rewrite all your code to look like this. I've deliberately chosen things that you might not have thought possible um, to show that, that those things are possible, not that I'm advocating you go away and make all of your code look like this. Um, so yeah, don't burn me at the stake. Um, so this Java 8 talk. Java 8 may be fairly old news now. I don't know how, how many of you are using Java 8 in production? Nearly nobody, OK. Yeah, entirely different uh, response in London. We had about 60%, uh, 70% of people using Java 8 in production, uh, which is interesting. So it's quite old news for us. Uh, my team even started using Java 8 in production about eight weeks before Java 8 was released. Um, yeah. Uh, it was it's pretty stable compared to the tools you get in the uh, Node ecosystem, for example. Um, uh, so it's pretty old news to us, but I think this is a really exciting time for us as a community because uh, Java 7's end of life now. Uh, Java 8's been out well over a year. Um, it's finally starting to get decent adoption, and we can. Um, this is the point where we as a community can start moving forward, assuming that things we're building. Uh, a Java 8, we don't have to support all the old versions anymore. So that's why I think it's, it's worth talking about now. Most of the Java 8 talks that I've been to, at least, have been about new language features, but in the context of new library features like streams, completable futures, optionals, and ways it makes writing the kind of code we normally write a bit easier. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. I want to talk about what I personally find exciting about Java 8. Uh, we're very used to waiting extremely long time for new versions of Java to get released. Uh, Java 8 uh, even took so long to get released that Duke Nukem Forever got released first. Not only that, but there's no guarantee that the features we want are going to make it into the language. Obviously, every feature has to be weighed up cost-benefit. It may not be worth adding it to the language. It might add lots more complexity than the value it brings. And there's only finite resources for working on improving the language. Um, so we have to wait a long time. We may not get the features we want. Um, so we're stuck writing 
code in the way we've always written it, even when we see the programming language community as a whole kind of, they have new ideas, they're, they're writing more concise, more expressive code, all those things we saw in Kotlin just now, um, and Envy from other languages, uh, we have to wait a long time to get them. So what I find really exciting about Java 8 is to some extent, these days are over. There's a whole category of features that have traditionally been language features that we can now implement as library features um, using plain old Java. Using plain old Java means that uh, we can do it without what I call magic. I think the Java ecosystem has been blighted by a uh, preponderance of frameworks that do lots of things under the hood that I'd call magic because it's very hard to understand what they're doing. Things like uh, bytecode manipulation, like uh, code generation, there's things like Project Lombok that help you write more concise code, but you're not actually writing Java, they're generating loads of stuff behind the scenes. Um, and when all that stuff's happening, you can't really understand why the code is doing what it's doing. But if we can do it with plain Java, then uh, we can just uh, read it in our IDE. If we don't know how something works, we can go browse the definition, educate ourselves. Uh, we can even step through it in a debugger in the IDE and really understand what's going on, as long as we understand the basics of how the language works. Um, it's going to be a lot easier to explain what I mean with some examples, but uh, first, I was wondering how many people have written code that uses Lambda expressions? Because none of you were using Java 8. Almost none of you, okay. As I said, hopefully you will um, understand kind of what's possible with the code, even if you don't fully understand what's going on. Um, but since you're not, most of you aren't using lambdas, there's a really quick um, example. Wow, this is a really low res monitor. Um, hang on. Let me just resize that. There we go. Um, so I have to have the browser Chrome, I'm afraid. Uh, so Lambda expressions, uh, they're really quite simple. They represent a method effectively, um, but they're anonymous, and we can avoid a load of the boilerplate. So if we had a method called foo, which had some code in it, we could represent that as a Lambda expression like this. Um, we've, we just omitted the return type, which is void in this case, um, and we haven't had to give it a name either, it's anonymous. Uh, and of course, we can give parameters. So if we had a method that took two strings, returned a string, we could represent that as a lambda, takes two parameters, uh, returns a string. Again, we've not had to specify a name of the method, and we haven't had to specify the types either, because the compiler can infer them. Uh, hopefully, has, have people seen lambdas before? Yeah, most, most people seem to have seen them before. So hopefully that makes some sense. The really powerful thing about lambdas is that uh, they represent code, but you can treat it as data. So um, here's that same lambda, takes two parameters, returns a string. I can assign that to a variable, or I can uh, pass it as a parameter to another method. Um, which, and that's, so that's the new exciting thing. Um, and that's what's going to power a lot of what we're talking about today. Um, so example of what I'm talking about, I'm, I'm arguing that uh, things that have traditionally been language features, we can move into library features. So let's take a really basic example of a language feature. Uh, if block, uh, a language built in, we rely on every day for all our code we write. Uh, so we've got, we say if, and then some Boolean expression, then we've got our code block. But if we didn't know that that was a language built in, what does it look like? Well, to me, and maybe this is just my brain, but it looks almost like a method invocation. Uh, so we've got a name, like a method name. This almost looks like uh, a parameter uh, list. We've got our parameter specified here. Uh, which is a Boolean expression. And then we've got this block of code, which is where the analogy falls down, because we don't have that in method calls. But uh, now we have Lambda expressions, we can represent those blocks of code as data, and we could pass it into a method call. So if we wanted to, we could go and implement 
if inside a method. So we can't call it if because that's a reserved word in Java. But uh, so I call it when, uh, meaning much the same thing. So this is a static method. Then we have a parameter list. And we pass in our Boolean expression, same one. And then that same code that we had after our if block, we can pass in as a lambda expression into this method call. So it looks very similar to the if we had. Uh, but now the implementation has moved into a library somewhere. Uh, why would you bother doing that? Since we have if, it's perfectly good already. Uh, well, the, the main power is that we can then start making changes to how these things behave. Um, one of the most common complaints about things like if, try, uh, case um, in Java is that they don't, they're kind of blocked, they, they don't behave as expressions. We can't return a value from them and assign them to a variable, um, which kind of limits some of the, the ways we can write code. Um, but if, uh, if it was in a library, then we could kind of extend this ourselves at our own leisure. A much wider group of people can work on those features than uh, the language designers. And we, we might be able to do something like this. Obviously, with if, uh, we do have the ternary if in Java, which does behave like an expression. Um, but it's, it's just the simplest example I could come up with. Um, so we want it to return a value. Just as before, we have our method when, takes our Boolean expression, same code. But now we're going to return a value from it. Um, and then we can assign that to a variable by having a return type from our static method. Uh, obviously, this condition may not be true, so we need a way of uh, specifying a default value as well. <coughs> um, so now, uh, we've made an extension to a language feature um, by having it into a library somewhere. But how would you implement this? Well, it's quite straightforward, actually. Especially as, in this case, Java already has the feature in the form of the ternary if. Um, so we've got a static method, uh, when which could be statically imported, so you don't need to qualify it in your code. Uh, you pass in a, your Boolean condition as the first parameter, which is this. And then the second parameter, we're passing in a supplier of a value. Um, which This is an interface that is in the Java 8 standard library that is equivalent to this lambda here, because it's a lambda that takes no parameters and returns the value. Um, if you've not used lambdas before, this is probably quite new to you. Uh, but uh, so that that is there is equivalent to the lambda. And all we do is return if the condition is true, we're retaining an optional of evaluate the result of evaluating that lambda, and if it's not, then we're returning empty. And then that's so that's the code that powers this slide basically. Is that kind of making sense so far? Um, since none of you are using lambdas, hands up if you're completely confused. I'm going to assume assume that. We can carry on then. Uh, so another example. Does anyone remember Project Coin? A few nods. Um, Project Coin, uh, back when Java 7 uh, was being developed, Project Coin was uh, a thing adding a few new simple enhancements to the language. Uh, things like underscores in uh, number literals came out of Project Coin. Probably the most useful feature is try with resources um, that came out. So previously, if you had some resource that needed cleanup after you used it, like a database connection or um, a buffered reader in this case, uh, you have to have a try finally block. And you say try, you use your resource, and then in your finally block, you clean it up manually. Java 7 gave us try with resources, um, where we can try, then we can use our resource. And then in the uh, block of code afterwards, you can use it safe in the knowledge that when the block terminates, it's going to clean it up for you. So that was quite nice. But what if we'd had lambdas at the time? Um, I'm going to argue it would be completely unnecessary to add that feature to the language. Um, if uh, any of you have used C Sharp, um, they, they have a very similar construct called using which behaves almost the same as try with resources in Java. Um, so again, since uh, try is a reserved keyword, we can't use that. But we could implement in a library exactly the same thing now that we have lambdas. So we can say using. This is, a, again, a static method. 
uh, we take the same resource that we had in our try with resources statement, um, and then we can pass as our second parameter a lambda that accepts that resource, um, and then we can make use of it. And again, in the implementation of this method, we can do the cleanup, and then as we're using this, we'll know that it gets cleaned up for us. This is actually even more concise than the Java 7 version because you don't have to specify the type because the compiler's inferred for us that it's a buffered reader. Again, quite straightforward to implement, just using the try finally that we had prior to Java 7. So we've got a static method. Uh, it's generic. It operates on any type that is auto-closable. That just means that it provides a close method that we can invoke. Static method we can import again. It takes one of those values that's closable, and it takes a, a consumer of that value. Again, this is equivalent to a lambda that accepts a value and can use it. Then we just have a normal try finally block. We try this, we evaluate the lambda, we pass in the value, and then in the finally we clean it up. And so again, uh, something that had to, we had to wait for a new version of the language for, we could actually have implemented ourselves if we'd had lambdas at the time. And that's what I find really exciting about Java 8, is this whole category of features, uh, the wider community as a whole can start uh, implementing them, and um, we can release them as frequently as we like. We can pick and choose what we want to include in our projects. We don't have to wait for new versions of the language to come along. Uh, any any uh, questions so far? No, completely confused. Okay, uh, just just wave if we uh, if you have questions as we go, because there's not many of us. We can afford to stop. Uh, I'm a massive Star Trek fan, so every uh, talk has to have a Star Trek reference in it. Um, let's see, a Star Trek t-shirt. <laughs> um, so this is uh, Scotty from Star Trek. One of the things that Scotty's famous for saying is uh, that you can't break the laws of physics, uh, which is kind of an odd thing to say on Star Trek, I think, because from our perspective, they kind of do break the laws of physics. They travel faster than the speed of light, for example. Um, but I think uh, we often view uh, what's uh, in the Java language spec and what is um, the features that we know Java has as like the laws of physics of Java. And if we, we know Java doesn't have that feature, we think we can't write code in that style. Um, but I don't, I don't think that has to be the case. As I said on Star Trek, they travel faster than the speed of light, which from our perspective is breaking the laws of physics. But what they're actually doing is that they understand the laws of physics better and they're able to work around these fundamental limitations because they understand them. So in the case of traveling faster than the speed of light, what they do instead is they essentially create a shorter route to their destination than light takes and travel along it slower than the speed of light but still arrive at their destination before light does. Um, so. Um, they, they, they understand the laws of physics well, and they're able to work around the fundamental limitations because of that. And I think we can take the same principles um, and apply them to uh, Java. So we've already talked about lambda expressions, but uh, Java 8 comes with a whole load of new features that are um, essentially new laws of physics, new tools that allow us to uh, extend the language almost and write code in different styles that we might not have considered before. Method references, uh, we'll see some examples later. They're essentially sugar for uh, lambda expressions of a particular type, but they're convenient for referencing properties on objects. And we have also default and static methods on interfaces. Um, and excitingly, uh, it, we have uh, a thing called structural typing. Uh, for the first times. Uh, so uh, Java is essentially what's called nominally typed, which means we have to declare the names of types generally. Uh, we know if we have an expression of type integer, we can't assign that to a variable of type string. Um, we know that if we want to uh, assign an, um, store something in a variable of type iterable, we have to implement the iterable interface explicitly. Um, 
and uh, we have to declare new types with names. Um, for the first time in Java 8, we have some level of structural typing, which is the type system you have in languages like Go, where uh, if you implement the in methods on an interface just with the same type signatures, then you have considered, you're considered to be implementing that interface without having explicitly said that you are. So in Java 8, we have this kind of structural typing with uh, lambdas. So if we have a lambda with a particular structure, in this case, it takes a value and it returns a Boolean. We could assign that to a type uh, function from string to Boolean. That is what it is. It's structurally equivalent. Uh, and we could also uh, store that in a type of predicate of string. These are both types in Java util function in Java 8. Um, but so it's exactly the same lambda expression, but it's structurally equivalent to any type that matches its uh, um, structure. <laughs> uh, this is what makes lambdas really useful for using with our existing code. Uh, for example, in the file class in Java IO, there's a list method which traditionally would have passed a file filter implementation to. But uh, we can also pass a structurally equivalent lambda. In this case, it takes a name and a file, and it returns a Boolean. So any lambda with that structure can be passed to that method because it's equivalent to the interface. Does that make sense? Any questions? OK. So what, yeah, is that a question? No. OK, so one of the uh, other uses of this is it helps us write more expressive code. Um, so, for example, if we have a lambda expression that returns two numbers added together, so it takes a and b, returns a plus b, we could assign that to a variable, call it an adder, and that we could call that a by function, which again is a type in Java util function, from integer and another integer returning an integer. We can do that. So it's structurally equivalent to that type, um, but a that's that's quite a long type signature. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, and B, it doesn't really tell me much about uh, what that's doing in our code. Um, why are we using it in our uh, domain? Most of the time, I'm writing code to solve a business problem, and I want to be as expressive as possible about uh, what the problem is that we're solving and why we're solving it. Uh, if we use terms like by function, that's not really telling me anything. But thanks to structural typing, we could equally well de de declare our own type uh, for this uh, that means something more meaningful. Uh, maybe I'm building a calculator, in which case I might declare an interface called calculation. Uh, it's structurally equivalent. It's going to take two numbers, return a number, and then I can assign exactly the same lambda expression to that. Um, I'd even go as far as to say, why not try avoiding using Java util function types uh, where possible, uh, and instead declare your own types that are more meaningful, just as uh, you wouldn't go and write all your code using primitive types, using built-in types like string, because that would tell you absolutely nothing about uh, the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, in the same way, uh, if we just use the built-in types, we're going to limit ourselves in the same way. Let's kind of skip this because of time. Um, but I mentioned uh, bending the laws of physics, uh, going beyond what we think is possible. Structural typing is particularly useful for doing kind of perverse things like this. Uh, how many people have run into this problem? They've tried to do something like this in Java. So, has anyone tried to do that? And can anyone tell me why it doesn't work? Yep. Um, because at runtime, the generics don't exist. Yeah, runtime generics don't exist. Um, that, yes, yeah, so that's, that's, that's kind of true. It's, so it's to do with type erasure. Uh, it's kind of, if you know that Java erases the generic type information at runtime, then it's kind of easy to convince yourself why it doesn't work. Um, if you have these two methods in the same class and you remove the information we had in the generic types, these two methods now have the same type signature, so the compiler wouldn't let you do that. Um, it's slightly more complicated than that. Um, in this case, actually, if you, you can use reflection, and you could get back the generic type information there, because it's statically available. 
but suffice to say that uh, in not in all cases would that be possible. So um, to avoid even more complicated scenarios, the Java language spec explicitly prohibits you from uh, overloading a method in this type. It says basically thou shalt not have two methods with the same name and where they are override equivalent and that it define override equivalent as not including this uh, generic type information. So like speed of light, it's a fundamental limitation. We're forbidden from doing it, but we can kind of work around it. Like uh, most problems in computer science with another layer of indirection um, and uh, our structural types. Um, again, I'm not suggesting you go and do this. It's probably a very bad idea. I'm just suggesting that uh, it's useful to understand the features um, so that we can uh, not be limited by uh, our limited understanding. So we can't uh, have two methods overloaded and have the, them differ only by the generic type information, but we can pull that out so it's no longer in the, the method type signature and it will work. So um, instead of passing a list of strings or a list of integers, I can pass a reference to a list of strings and a reference to a list of integers, um, where a reference is something that I can ask to give me a list of strings or give me a list of integers on demand. Uh, and so how can I do that? Well, Java 8 has this um, built-in type called a supplier, uh, which is very similar to a reference. It's uh, uh, on demand, it can give me a list of string. So we've got that same generic type information there. What I've done is created a new type to uh, represent that uh, by declaring an interface here. I can do that inline in my class. Um, and then we accept that type instead of the, the raw list string in our method signature. And then we can call that, without actually having to know about list string ref or list integer ref, uh, we can call that uh, simply by passing a structurally equivalent lambda, which is basically a lambda that takes no parameters and returns either a list of strings or a list of integers. And then the compiler can infer that that's structurally equivalent to a reference to a list of strings or a reference to a list of integers without the caller having to know that. Uh, and uh, this will invoke that method and this will invoke that method. So even something completely forbidden by the spec, we're actually able to work around um, uh, once we fully understand how the features we have at our disposal work. So I'm arguing that that's, that we should really understand those. So th this, this tends to go differently with different audiences. Uh, what would you say is the number one complaint about Java, the language, any thoughts? When you talk to people about Java, maybe people use other languages, what do they, what's the, what are their complaints? It's verbose. Yes, excellent, okay. Um, but that's what I had. Uh, usually, you often get, some people say it's slow when they don't realize that that's not a language problem, that's a, a VM thing and actually it's really fast. Um, verbosity tends to be the next thing um, that comes up, uh, although sometimes if you ask people highly technical Java audiences, they come up with all kinds of weird, uh, obscure language features that they want to fix. But verbosity is what I hear most. There's sometimes some debate about whether it's actually a problem. Uh, people argue, okay, we have great tools, we can auto-generate all of our boilerplate code, does it really matter? Um, after all, we're reading code more than we're writing code. I think it does matter. Um, I think it leads to problems such as primitive obsession, which I touched on earlier, uh, where uh, rather than like, define our own types, we lean on primitives or built-in types, uh, and it's because of this friction introduced by the verbosity. Uh, so for example, I see this kind of thing all the time, I'm guilty of doing it sometime, we'll have a method, takes a, this is taking a volume, and I've just declared it as an integer because a number represents a volume value. But I can't tell here what's the maximum value that could take, I can't tell, uh, well, I can't ask what are all the places that that volume's used throughout my code base, because it'll be mixed up with all of the other reasons I've used numbers in my code base. Uh, and it, it doesn't, so it doesn't really tell me very much at all, but yet we still continue to do this kind of thing. Um, it'd be much better, I think, to define our own type, and then we can ask our IDE to go find all the references to it. We can look at the definition to see what 
valid values it can have. Um, but we tend to not do that. And why not? I think it has to do with verbosity. So this is what IntelliJ generates. Bearing in mind, I just want to represent a numerical value here. Single field. Um, we've got a class. We've got a, a field. We've got a constructor. I've added some uh, validation to that. Uh, then we usually get some getters and setters generated. Uh, and then if you want to do equality, store it in collections, we're going to need an equals, we're going to need a hash code. Uh, might as well generate a two string while we're at it. Um, and then you end up with 42 lines of code when all we wanted to represent was a single number. So I think this is the kind of friction that uh, the verbosity introduces. At this point, someone on the team is probably going to start arguing about whether we should write tests for it because it's reducing our test coverage. Uh, and having a debate about where it belongs in the code base and so on. So these are the things that slow us down, and it's very easy to fall back to just doing things that are worse because of the verbosity. I, I would argue for starting small. Why not just declare a uh, use a public field? Uh, some people have a irrational fear of public fields, I think. Um, what, yeah, you can change it later, just like any, any, any code. Um, but there are other things that are possible now. So we talked about lambdas, we talked about structural typing. Um, this is something that I do sometimes to introduce a type with really minimal um, overhead in terms of writing code. Um, then I can then go back and change it to a full-blown class later really quite easily. Uh, so I've, for my volume, I've declared an interface called volume. That has a single numerical value. Probably shouldn't call that value, but uh, um, it's just got a single method. Um, and then, since in Java 8 we can have static methods on interfaces, um, I've created a constructor effectively. It's a static method. It gives us back a instance of that volume, takes in the value, and because this is a single method interface, that can just return a lambda that wraps the value, and that lambda is has captured that value and it's structurally equivalent to this interface type. Uh, so we can use that just by calling update, pass in a volume, and give it our value. Um, and then that's uh, all that's needed to have our, um, I've lost it now, but uh, re to replace uh, the, at least the minimal Java class time. It's, um, it doesn't have all the features. We don't have our equals hash code and so on, uh, but it's very small. Um, and if we want to change that to a class later, it's very easy. We can either go change the definition or we can uh, uh, implement it properly. And we could do all the normal stuff as well. We could add our validation to the constructor. Uh, we, could, uh, we could even add behavior because um, we have default methods on interfaces now. So here I've added a method that, takes, that increases the volume um, and returns a new instance. It's immutable. Uh, which mean, um, because it's an interface, it can't have any state. Um, and as I said, we can easily change it to a class if we need to. Um, we could have more fields. At this point, it's probably getting a bit silly and we should declare a class for it. But, um, so if we have more fields, then we can't use lambdas anymore because it's no longer structurally equivalent to a lambda expression because it's got more than one method. Uh, but we can still return a new instance of that interface and we've still got a, a classless type. Um, and in the same way, we can capture the more than one field. Um, but the reason I added an example with more than one field was that I wanted to talk about equals and hash code, which were one of the most verbose things from the Java Bean example. There are tools in Java now to auto-generate equals hash code, but most of them rely on what I called early on magic, where uh, they'll either use something like reflections to scan through the fields, or they'll um, do uh, Java proxy hacks or similar uh, things where we can't really tell what's going on. Um, but using these, we could implement auto-generate equals hash code using pure Java features relatively easily. Uh, so we've not got too much time to go into the details, but um, essentially, instead of just returning the interface directly, if we um, extend a value type that we can use as our base type, and uh, other than that, we keep it the same as we had before. Uh, we can invoke any methods on this value type. Um, and what I've done here is I've declared a using method on the base type to which I can pass a set of uh, 
method references to properties on this type, uh, which means that I could then capture the values of those and use it to auto-generate the equals hash code values. Uh, that's actually relatively easy to do. If we wanted to look at how that's done, click through it in our IDE, we'd see something like this. So we've got a value-based type. It's generic. It works on any type. It has a using method. It takes a uh, arbitrary number of functions. Uh, a function is built in uh, type equivalent to a lambda expression or a method reference. Um, and uh, so a reference to the method paint on this type here is equivalent to a lambda expression that, given an instance of paint, will return the result of invoking this method read on it. It's just it's sugar for kind of a paint arrow paint dot red. But they, they look kind of like properties on here when we pass it. Um, and then we can just capture those, store them, then to calculate the hash code and equals methods, we could just iterate over them or stream through them and calculate a value based off of um, evaluating those uh, method references. Um, and, uh, and so, I mean, that, was, that example was getting quite verbose, but it's still an awful lot more concise than the uh, class equivalent. Even something as simple as a class definition that you probably do, I don't know, dozens of times a day, there are other ways of doing it that you might not have considered. Um, so it's really worth understanding what all the new features are and how they work. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, probably got time for one more example then. Um, we'll talk about named parameters, another language feature that people uh, miss in Java sometimes. Um, they help you have clarity at the call site of invoking a function uh, as to what's actually going on. So here I'm creating a person type. I'm passing in three parameters. You might be able to guess what those parameter values mean because of the examples I've used, but it can get confusing right, with more, um, more, especially as you have more parameters. It would be somewhat clearer, and you can do this in other languages if you can say what the names of these values are uh, at the call site, and then just scanning that code, you can see what's going on. But we don't have that. So in Java, we generally work around it using something like the builder pattern. right? So uh, we use the fact that methods have names to be able to name those uh, values so that when we're scanning through the code, we can see what's going on. There are other uses, uses for the builder pattern, but this is one of the most common. Um, and so there, we've, we've kind of got the benefit of named parameters. But again, why don't we do this? It comes back to verboseness. This is what IntelliJ generates. We've got our three fields which have duplicated what was defined in the person type itself. Uh, it gives you a setter for each, which each of those setters is four lines long because we have to return itself, and we need a method to actually create the person at the end of it. Uh, so that ended up being 26 lines, and it duplicated everything that was in person. And all we wanted to do was make things a bit clearer, give ourselves names. So again, can we do things a bit differently? using the new features that we have. Um, so uh, we can using uh, the structural typing technique again. So reminder of what we're aiming for, uh, specify methods for each of these. We're going from a method or a constructor that takes three parameters um, to this kind of builder here. Now, if you're familiar with functional programming, you may have come across a thing called currying. Um, which is basically going from a method that takes, say, three parameters and converting that to a method that takes one parameter, returns a method that takes another parameter, returns a method that takes another parameter, which then returns the result of the whole thing. So that is really what's going on here in the builder pattern. We've, got, we've gone from a person constructor that takes three values to a chain of methods that each take a single value and return the next state in the chain. The, the difference here is that we really wanted to be able to name those methods so that they tell us something. Um, but thanks to structural typing, we can do that. So we represent each of those states as a type. So I declare an interface for the first state where we specify our first name. When we specify our first name, we get back the state where we want to specify the last name, and so on through the chain until we get to the end where we specify the height. 
uh, and then that, when we do specify the height, we get back a fully constructed person. So three states in this three um, uh, value constructor. Um, and then we can implement those interfaces using a chain of lambda expressions, uh, which is why it's a bit like currying. So we have a static method to create our person. Instead of returning a person, that returns the first state in the chain, specify the first name. And then we return the chain of lambdas. So a lambda that takes the first name, returns a lambda that takes the last name, returns a lambda that takes the height, which returns the uh, uh, actual fully constructed person. Um, so that is, even when you split this lambda onto multiple lines like that to fit it on the slide, that's still less than half as long, I think, as the original IntelliJ generated. Um, and what's more, with the builder pattern, you lose the kind of safety that Java gives you. Uh, when, you when you invoke a method call, if you forget to specify one of the parameters, then the compiler's gonna tell you, right? But if you use the builder pattern, then generally that's gonna be a runtime error that you've forgotten to specify one of the parameters. Um, but this kind of gives you that back. Um, obviously there are some trade-offs, but uh, if you didn't specify the height, you'd be left with an expression of type specify height and not a type of, of person. So your expression is no longer gonna compile. So by understanding the new features and how they work, again, we've been able to do things in a simpler way than we have traditionally done them, and we've got some other benefits as well. Uh, I think we're probably, what time's this finish? Um, let, I'll wrap up in case there's some questions, um, but there's loads of other things we can do as well. In the previous talk, we saw pattern matching in Kotlin. Um, you can do similar things. Um, I'm not gonna go into how we do this now, but um, again, things like default method on a type, then you can give yourself a chain of builders to do things like match on that type. Uh, we could uh, implement uh, uh, matching, and yeah, let's... Um, just skip through some of this so we can have some questions. But wrapping up, so I've argued that things that have traditionally been language features, we can now implement as library features, and this gives the community the power to take uh, the way we write Java forward uh, without waiting for new versions of the language. I'm suggesting that you question things that you think are impossible, like uh, due to type erasure. Um, because they may not be, especially since the language is evolving all the time, so understand what is possible. And question the way you've always done things, because there may be new ways now that we have new tools at our disposal. Um, yep, that's uh, what I wanted to talk about. Thanks for listening. So hopefully we've got time for a few questions. If we baffled everyone. <coughs> Just one question. Yep. Very general question. Um, if you had to compare the, well, you say that Java 8 is not old news now, you've been using it for a long time, but if you had to compare the, the move from Java 7 to Java 8, it seems like there's a, quite a lot of new syntax and it's quite a big change from previous it's, yeah, it is a big change. Is I it think. the biggest change in the history of Java? or? So it's certainly the biggest change in the time that I've been using Java since, I guess, around 2000. Um, yeah, it, and it's made the biggest change to the way in which uh, our team writes code as well, even, even compared to generics, I would say. Yeah. Any other Thanks. questions? By the way, if you have any uh, language features that you envy from other languages, can you, yeah, please let me know, because I kind of like playing with this stuff. Um, and all those code examples I've just uh, taken from my blog, uh, so you can go and read them through at a slightly slower pace and uh, uh, understand what's going on. Okay, um, thanks again to the speaker, and just a reminder that there are some feedback cards at the back, so please leave your feelings. <laughs>